Okay, let's look at how to calculate correlation, correlation coefficients. In Excel, once again, we can go into data analysis and then select correlation and click OK. And what this will do is give us, uh, I'm assuming that we've already read in uh, Boston housing data. So what it's going to give you is a complete pairwise correlation coefficients. Okay, so we've got all the variables plotted here. These are all the variables in the file. The same variables are plotted on the y-axis as well. And every particular item here shows us the correlation between that pair of variables, right? So uh, Krim and Zn have a correlation coefficient of minus 0.2, which means not a very strong association. Krim and Indic, Indus have a correlation coefficient of 0.4 and so on. Okay, so for any pair of variables in our data set, we can see the correlation coefficient. Now, of course, Chas uh, Excel has treated it as a numerical variable and calculated correlation coefficient for that as well. Okay, so let's take a look at this diagram, this plot, and see whether we see any strong correlation coefficients. For example, the highest value that I'm able to see here is minus 0 0.7 uh, or plus 0 0.8, okay, uh, 7, 8, uh, which is you know expected because this is the median value of a house in a particular neighborhood and this is simply the categorized median value you know they've taken the median values and categorized them as, as high or low zero or one so obviously you expect a high correlation uh, but uh, lstat and median value also have a high correlation it looks like those are the really high correlations all the rest are pretty weak even 0 0.6 0 0.7 and so on are are indicators of good correlation okay so this is uh, of course we have not looked carefully at the variables in this data set but the idea is that we can pretty easily calculate the correlation coefficient between any two pairs of variables in R you can easily calculate the correlation coefficient once again uh, let's say we have read in the data uh, the Boston housing data stored it in a variable called data earlier we were storing it in a variable called H data so it could still be the same I just chose to call it as data and then you just do core data and you get a complete report of the correlation coefficient for all the pairs of variables once again so it's easy to do that um, here what I did was in uh, R commander you can do statistics summaries and correlation matrix and you can then choose the variables for which you want to calculate the correlation coefficient. So here, instead of selecting all the variables, I selected only five variables, age, B, crim, dists, and indus. And you can see here that we've got all the pairwise correlation coefficients. Obviously, the diagonal values are all 1.0 because the diagonal values are simply comparing correlation coefficient of age with age, which will obviously be one because when age increases, age is going to increase because it's the same variable. So the diagonals will be one, but outside of the diagonal, you get the value here. So for example, here is the correlation coefficient between B and H. And of course, here you see between B and H, it's the same thing. Okay, so one is, uh, so you'll have a repetition of the values on either side of the diagonal. So it's enough to look at either below the diagonal or above the diagonal. In Rattle, it does correlation coefficients in a somewhat more interesting way and uh, what you could do in rattle is uh, to select the data and I'll show a demo of this shortly you can select the data and then uh, read in the data of course we when we read in the data we assume that we've already done the uh, uh, you know done the conversion of chas to a categorical variable uh, and then you can do explore and then uh, select correlation and click execute. Once you do that, you get a report just like before, every variable versus every other variable, but you also get a nice chart. And this chart essentially is showing you by using straight lines, ovals and circles, the extent of correlation. So rather than showing you numbers, which you, know, you have with a chart with so many numbers, it's very difficult to make out anything at all but here we can make out something so the flatter the line is the better is the correlation so again on the diagonals you see absolute straight line indicating correlation coefficient of one but other than that 
if you got a circle an oval which is very thin like cat dot mead val and mead val for example or uh, here rad and tax so those are ovals which are more or less like straight lines indicating high correlation whereas the more fat the oval becomes that indicates lower correlation okay so this is just a visual representation of the correlation coefficient uh, the light the, uh, the the darker the color is that also indicates higher correlation but of course it's redundant because they've already shown you the correlation by the shape of the oval and that is good enough so rattle has this nice kind of chart uh, to show correlations between the variables the good thing about this is uh, that you can take in the correlations across many variables. Here we are really looking at 14 by 14 correlation variables. Yeah, 14 by 14 correlations and still it's not overwhelming. The numbers of course are truly overwhelming and here I have not even shown all the 14. I have shown only uh, uh, seven, six variables on the x-axis and a little bit more on the y-axis and still the numbers are just too difficult to take a look at whereas here we are looking at 14 by 14 and yet this conveys a lot of information so in that sense this is a useful correlation chart that you can do with rattle let's take a look at how we are going to do the correlations uh, correlation matrix in R in rattle so once again we're looking at Boston housing data so I open up rattle I look at the data tab in the data tab, I've indicated that I'm using an R data set because we've already read in H data. So I've gone here, dropped it down, selected H data. So we've got the data in. And notice that when I did this and clicked execute, it's able to show us all the variables and CHAS is indicated as a categoric variable, which is what we had done earlier. So that's all that's needed. We've got the data and we have also indicated don't partition it, which is do the work with all the data available and then we move to the explore tab summary is checked under summary so all we have to do is just uh, sorry we need correlations because that's what we are looking for and then we say execute and it has generated the chart that we looked at just now so that's really how you do this uh, correlation chart in rattle now let's take a look at some concepts of probability distributions So in probability distributions, we are talking about random variables. Why do we say a variable is a random variable? Well, it doesn't really mean that it's completely random. What it means is that it's a variable whose values can vary. Of course, that's why it's a variable. It's a random variable because it takes on many different values. For example, the height of people. Some people are you know, shorter, some people are taller, and there's a certain distribution or a household's annual income, or a home's price, or the outcome of a coin toss. All of these are random variables because they can take on multiple different values and very often we are interested in predicting a value. Okay, so that's why you call it as a random variable, a variable which assigns a numerical value to each outcome of an experiment or a trial. Of course, random variables can be discrete, like a coin toss, in which case it can either be a head or a tail or if you throw a die it can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or if you throw two dice it can be 1 through 12 which is discrete or uh, tomorrow it's either going to rain or not going to rain or it's either going to snow or not going to snow and so on. So these are all discrete random variables which can take on discrete values or you could have continuous random variables which can take on really continuous values, a continuous real values so heights of people weights of people and so on are continuous variables so random variables can be continuous or discrete a discrete random variable dis determines the probability of each possible outcome the probability distribution of a discrete random variable determines the probability of each possible outcome for example when you have a coin a fair coin you toss it you say the probability of heads is 0.5 the probability of tails is 0.5 that's it there are no other possibilities and that is the probability distribution for a coin toss. Uh, alternately you may have a probability distribution for rain so you may say the probability it's going to rain tomorrow is 0.1 the probability it's not going to rain is 
Okay, so again, that's a discrete random variable. It assigns a value to each possibility. Of course, both the examples we have considered are discrete random variables which can take on only one of two values. But you could have discrete random variables that can take on multiple values. For example, uh, how many customers, the number of customers who are going to show up in the bank between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. tomorrow. That's a discrete random variables variable, but it can take on many values. It could be zero customers, nobody shows up, or could be 200 customers with possibly every single value in between uh, occurring. In fact, it will be a probability distribution where uh, there could be many. It's possible that 200,000 customers will show up at the bank between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. tomorrow, except that that's got a very, very low probability, 0 0.0000001. That could be the case. Whereas the probability of let's say between zero and 50 customers showing up might be really high, might be 0.8 and so on. Okay, so you could talk about discrete random variables and their probability distributions even for things which have more than two outcomes. Continuous random variables, well, uh, it shows the probability of the random variable taking on a value between two given numbers. Okay, that's the difference between discrete and continuous. In discrete, you say this is the probability of this particular outcome. In continuous, because the variable is totally continuous, the, you cannot say that the outcome uh, of the outcome could be exactly one particular value. In fact, the probability of a very specific value occurring is very close to zero. But what you're talking about in continuous random variable, when you talk about a probability distribution, you're really talking about what is the probability of a value falling in a given range. So that is why uh, we represent a continuous probability distribution by a probability density function, which is a continuous straight, continuous line. Whereas for a discrete probability distribution, the density function won't be a continuous line. It might be a histogram or something like that. Okay, so what does, we often see the probability density function being indicated like this. What exactly does it mean? For a continuous probability density function, it's a curve and the area under the curve is considered as 1.0. The total area under the curve is 1.0 because that represents the complete space of what is going to happen. So for example, suppose we are talking about heights of people. Well, probability that some a person is going to have some height, that is one, okay? So that's what is shown here. So all the possible heights together, the probability is one. So the probability that a height will fall in this range is one. In fact, in this particular case, uh, the, the, the chart really extends from zero. Uh, if it's a height, it cannot be less than zero. It extends from zero to infinity. Nobody can be infinitely tall, but you know somebody can be really, really tall, except the probability is very, very low. That's all it is. Okay, so this is what the probability density function looks like. And the important point is that the total area under this curve is 1.0. Now, uh, the area to the left of the line here indicates the proportion of values that will have less than V1, right? So suppose this is heights and V1 happens to be five feet, 10 inches. Then the area to the left of V1 indicates the proportion of people who are less than five feet, less than or equal to five feet, 10 inches tall. And the area to the right, of course, indicates people who are uh, taller than five feet, 10 inches, right? So the area between two lines, of course, is going to indicate the probability that a value falls between those two ranges. So let's say this is five feet, uh, 10 inches, and this is five feet, three inches. This area shows you the proportion of people who are between five feet, three inches and five feet, 10 inches. And what is the use of this? Okay, this is all fine. How exactly do we use it? The use comes into play because we can convert that proportion to a probability, right? So we are saying the total area under the curve is 1.0 and this is the proportion of observations which will fall less than V1 or greater than V1 or between V1 and V2 or whatever. You can therefore say the probability is now 
the area under the curve. So for example, suppose this is once again this height v1 is 5 feet 3 inches. What we are saying is the proportion of people who are less than 5 feet 3 inches is, is this, is the area under the curve. In other words, if you take a random person, the probability that the person will have a height less than 5 feet 3 inches is going to be the area under this curve. Okay, so what we have done is we have taken these proportions and converted them into probabilities. So we can say if I, if I observe 200 people walking through or coming to my store, the probability that uh, or the proportion of those people who will be uh, less than 5 feet 3 inches, we'll know this. Right, so now we can use this information productively. Or if you're, let's say, if you're, uh, if you're operating a shoe store and you want to determine how much of each size to stock, if you know the foot sizes of people, if you know the probability distribution of the foot sizes of people, then you can stock shoes according to that understanding of the probability distribution. Right, so that is how the probability distributions become useful because they allow you to calculate probabilities of certain events. So here the area is the probability uh, of h, that is probability of a value fall, falling between v0 and v1. Or in other words, probability of people whose height is between v0 and v1. So you obviously heard about the Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian distribution was actually initially studied by de Morbre. In, between 1667 and 1754, that's when he lived. Uh, but for whatever reason, it has been named for uh, Gauss, which is that the, the Gaussian distribution is named for Gauss. It is referred to as the normal distribution or more commonly as the Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian distribution is very important because it tends to show up in all kinds of places. Here I've just indicated, you know, uh, I really don't know why it was named for Gauss when it was invented by de Morbre. So the normal distribution essentially says this. It says you've got any normal distribution. It's got a mean. So in this case, we are considering a normal distribution with the mean mu. That's the population mean. And it's got a standard deviation sigma. A very important property of the normal distribution is that 68.2% of the values will be between within one sigma of the mean. Okay. In other words, suppose the mean is 100 and sigma is 10. Then you will expect to find 68.2% of the values between uh, 90 and 110 less, you know, one mu minus one sigma to mu plus one sigma, that will contain 68.2% of the values. Okay. Similarly, uh, you will have 13.6% of the values between mu minus one sigma, mu minus two sigma, and again, another 13.6% of the values between mu plus one sigma and mu plus two sigma. Okay. Or if you look at it totally, you will have uh, 68.2 plus uh, 27.2, which is almost 95% of the values, will be between within 2 sigma of the mean, and so on. And only 0.2% of the values will be 0.2% uh, of the values, 0.1 above 3 sigma and 0.1 below 3 sigma of the mean. So this is a common property of the normal distribution. Now, why is this so important? It's so important because a lot of things in the world are, they tend to follow the normal distribution. That is why I've said that it's ubiquitous. So because a lot of things follow the normal distribution and because normal distribution has these kinds of properties, that gives us a handle on many, many natural phenomena. This is just the density function for the uh, normal distribution. I've just shown it because it's one of those peculiar formulas in which both pi and e appear. That's a strange kind of thing. 
Okay, so now having understood that, let's study the role of the normal distribution in statistical inference. Of course, in this course, we are not really concerned about statistical inference, uh, but it's a good idea for us to know a little bit about what statistical inference is doing. Okay, so in statistical inference, what we are trying to do is, we've got a large population, for example, households in the US, and we are trying to do some work with, let's say, the uh, household incomes, and we are trying to estimate the household incomes or expenditures or things like that. We cannot obviously study the entire population. That would be too costly and too time consuming. And therefore, what we try to do is to take a sample and come to some conclusions based on the sample. That's the idea here. So here we take a concrete example. Of course, what we want to do then, study the sample, and then make inferences about the population based on what we studied with the sample. The idea being, of course, is your sample can be really small and therefore not as expensive, but you'll still be able to draw meaningful conclusions about the population. That's the whole discipline of statistics and statistical inference. Let's take an example here. Let's say that there's a company, ABC Inc., which was binding books. And let's say earlier, they, they used to take five minutes to bind a book, bind or do some operation on a book. So their earlier operation was five minutes, uh, was taking five minutes on the average. They recently instituted a new production process and they wanted to find out if the new production process is really better than the old process. Let's say what they have done is they've put the new production process into place in one department and they are trying to conduct a study to find if, if it has actually improved things. And if so, they'll implement it in many other departments. So the job now is to say, is the new production process better than the old process? Okay. So to do this, what they did was, with the new production process, they took a sample of books that use the new production process. And for each of those samples, they took the time that it took and found the average. So they found that the average time with the new process was 3.5 minutes. And of course, we also know that the average time with the old process was five minutes. So the question is, has the time decreased? Is the new process better? That is the question. Now, on the face of it, it looks obvious. Of course, old process took five minutes. The new process is taking 3.5 minutes and shorter time is better. So obviously, the new process is better. That's what it looks like on the face of it. But that may not entirely be correct because it is possible, after all, the new process measurement is based on a sample. It's not, it wasn't based on a population. So therefore, it is possible that the sample that you chose somehow tended to have only those books that took a shorter amount of time. Maybe the average is still five, but you just happen to find a sample that had an average of 3.5. That is possible. So in that case, it is possible that the new process is not any better than the old process, but you just found a sample that seemed to indicate that. And therefore, we cannot say anything conclusive. That could be the case. Okay. So now, how do we come to a conclusion? How do we know? How can we use this information to really determine what happened? Okay, so the, again, here you're seeing this is a problem of making an inference on the population based on something, based on a statistic measured on the sample. So we're making an inference about the population parameter based on a sample statistic. So how do you do this? The beauty is, of course, you since you took a sample, you can never really rule out the possibility that this particular sample was crazy. You can never rule it out. So you cannot ever say with 100% certainty. If when you take a sample, you can never say with 100% certainty any inference about the population. To do that, you have to study the entire population. You have to conduct a census or a survey. There's no way to arrive at that. But obviously that is not possible. So would it be nice, won't it be nice if we say, well, I did this sampling and I can say with 99% confidence that the time is actually better. There is a 1% chance that we may have got a freak sample, but 99% probability is that things have improved. 
So you can only make a probabilistic statement when you're talking about samples. Okay, but if somebody comes and says, look, I'm 99% confident that this is the case, you'll say, okay, I'll accept it because the risk is only 1%. Or suppose they say, I'm 99.9% .9 confident, you'll say, that's fine. That's an acceptable risk that I'll take. Okay, so it's only a probabilistic statement that can be made based on a sample. So how can we do this? The thing that allows us to do this is called the central limit theorem, once again studied by the same guy who came up with the normal distribution. And it is this that really allows us to make inferences about populations based on samples. It's a very central and important concept in probability in statistics. Okay, so for example, let's take this example. Let's say that you have a coin and you toss the coin 50 times. You count the number of heads and the number of tails. Okay, so you find out after, on this toss uh, experiment of tossing the coin 50 times, count the proportion, find the number of, find the proportion of heads. Okay, and you do this many, many, many times. Let's say you do this 10,000 times. Each time, toss the coin 50 times, take the proportion of heads. Okay. And then you plot a histogram of this. So clearly, in every trial of 50 tosses, you're not going to get exactly 25 heads and 25 tails. You won't get that. Most often, you'll get 25 heads, 25 tails, but very often. But quite, quite a lot of the times, you'll get 24, 26, 23, uh, you know, 27, even sometimes 20, 30. And there is even a likelihood that you may get 50, 0 or 0, 50. That is even possible. You cannot rule it out. It can happen. But it's going to happen extremely rarely. Okay. So what we're saying is for every time we toss 50 coins, uh, 50 tosses, and then we take the proportion of heads and we do this many, many times and then plot the histogram of this. So what we will find is that the histogram has its peak at 50, clearly, and but the other values are still possible. And the probability or the, the frequency of the other values keeps on decreasing as, we, as the proportion goes further and further away from 50, uh, from 0.5. Okay, so here you can see uh, that values below 0.4 and values above 0.6 are becoming extremely rare. But they're still there, but very close to zero. Okay, so this is what you're going to get. And the beauty is that this is a normal distribution. This is a normal distribution. So the central limit theorem is actually talking about this concept. What it's saying is, if you take several large samples from a population, calculate the mean of each sample, just like we did, right? We took, uh, you know, samples. Every time we tossed a coin, we took a sample from the probability distribution of the coin toss. But we took 50 samples each time. That's what we did. So same thing. Several large samples from a population, calculate the mean of each sample and look at the distribution of the mean, which is exactly what we did here. We looked at the distribution. We said, what is the proportion of heads? That's the distribution of the mean. So look at the distribution of the means of the sample beads and irrespective of what the underlying probability distribution of the population is, the sample means will always be distributed normally. This is somewhat a magical kind of finding. No matter what kind of a distribution you take, that distribution has a certain mean. And if you draw many samples and plot the mean of all those samples, you will find that the means are distributed normally, no matter what the underlying distribution is. And the mean of the sample mean is going to be the mean of the original population, right? Which is what we saw once again here. We saw that this has a mean of 50, 0.5, which is the probability of, which is a proportion of heads that you'll get or proportion of tails that you'll get, okay? And that is the, uh, the mean of the sample means as well. This is a very important finding in statistics that if you take samples, and if you take the mean of the samples many, many times, you'll find that the sample means are distributed normally.
That is the essence of the central limit theorem. And this single observation drives a lot of things in statistics. Okay, so essentially what De Morvis said is irrespective of the population distribution, the sample mean, which is x bar, is normally distributed with the mean mu, which is the mu of the underlying distribution, and the variance is going to be sigma square divided by n, where sigma is the variance of the underlying distribution. Uh, sigma is the standard deviation of the underlying distribution and n is your sample size. Okay, so in other words, if you are given a probability distribution, then you know that the sample means drawn from that probability distribution will be distributed normally with certain parameters. So how exactly is this useful? Let's go back to our book example. So earlier the time per book was five minutes and let's say the standard deviation was half a minute earlier before we introduced the new process. And let's say now the time per book is three and a half minutes. That's the new production process based on a sample of 200. Okay, so now the question is, we got a sample and the sample mean was three and a half minutes. Okay, now the question we can ask is, what is the chance of me getting this sample if the if nothing has changed? In other words, if the distribution still has a mean of five minutes. In other words, if the new process has had no impact and essentially the average is still five, if that is the case, what is the probability of me seeing a sample that has an average of 3.5? If this is very unlikely, then we can say, well, you know what, this could not have happened by accident. Really, something has changed. Or alternately, you may say, you know, depending on the numbers, you may say, no, this could have happened by accident. Is, there, is there is even a 30% chance that this might have happened by accident. Meaning that, the, you know, the number is still really 5, but you got a 3.5 by freak chance. And there's a 30% chance that it could have happened. As opposed to saying, there's only a 0.001% chance that this could have happened. Okay, so that's what we are saying. What is the probability that nothing has changed? In other words, the time is average time is still five minutes, but you somehow randomly uh, saw a free sample whose average time was 3.5 minutes. What is the probability that this can happen? Okay, so now we know that if nothing has changed, then the central limit theorem tells, after all, we drew a sample. We know that now the distribution of the sample mean. So we drew a sample and we got the mean, right? So we know that the sample mean is distributed like this. It is distributed with a mean of five, which is if nothing has changed, the average is still five. And the standard deviation earlier was 0.5. So the variance is now 0.5 squared divided by 200, which is what the formula said, okay? So we know the distribution of the sample mean. And from this, let's say we put five as the mean, we know the standard deviation is this 0.5 squared divided by 200. That gives a standard deviation of 0.035. And therefore, we do uh, 0.035, 1 sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma. So 3 sigma away from the mean is still only 4. Point, uh, is 4.895. Okay. So what this says is the probability that you can observe a sample which has an average below 4.895 is only 0.1%. Okay, so it's extremely unlikely that if your population still has a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 0.5, it is extremely unlikely that you can get even a sample mean of 4.895. That itself has only a 0.1% probability. Getting a sample mean of 3.5 is extraordinarily unlikely because 3.5 is even much further to the left of this. So the probability of getting a sample with a mean of 3.5 minutes, assuming that nothing has changed in the process, is very, very close to zero. So you can say with a lot of confidence that because I got a sample mean of 3.5, that means something really has changed. It's very unlikely 
that we got this by accident. However, you can never say with 100% confidence that this is the case. But this comes as close to 100% as you can ever have. So that's just an idea of how the central limit theorem and the normal distribution play a role in statistics. I have to admit that we are not going to use this idea a lot in the rest of the course.